Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to be talking about Cassini mission but specifically about the discovery that was uh, announced by NASA in um, April of 2017 in regards to one of the moons of Saturn known as Enceladus and the exciting news was that we now think that there's a slight possibility or possibly maybe even bigger possibility that Enceladus might actually have life on it. Anyway, welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So in today's video we're going to be using several simulations including Space Engine and uh, another one known as NASA's Eyes and we're going to be looking at this tiny dot that we're coming toward that we actually just missed a second ago this tiny dot right here known as Enceladus this is one of the moons of Saturn and it's essentially a frozen world. It's a tiny frozen world that doesn't look very tiny, but it's actually relatively small. Its diameter is um, less than 500 kilometers, and it's basically um, maybe the size of England, or United Kingdom. Basically, here's actually what the comparison of Enceladus, Moon, and Earth looks like. This right here is Enceladus. It's not very big. It's actually really, really small. Now, we're going to be talking about this object from a more scientific perspective, and we're going to just make some uh, assumptions, but not a lot. So let's actually start with the discoveries and how they were made. I'm going to use NASA's eyes for this. And this is a free simulation that you can download for directly from NASA. And uh, so here I'm going to go into one of the mission events. Uh, I believe we're going to go into this one, Discovery at Enceladus. Now this is a pretty awesome visualization of what actually occurred there. And uh, so here's Cassini approaching Saturn. And so right now you can actually kind of see what's going to happen. During the flyby of Enceladus, it flew by these plumes that you can't really see here, but you might be able to see them when I actually zoom in a little bit better, uh, that were formed by various geysers and various eruptions from um, within Enceladus. Now, um, we're going to wait for another simulation here that might actually demonstrate this a little bit better. And um, Cassini did this several times and eventually was able to actually detect some of the very interesting molecules, including things like salt, specifically water salt that we often have in our own water. And um, very recently, specifically uh, in April of 2017, we were able to actually finally discover what's known as molecular hydrogen, which is actually kind of interesting. So let's actually go to Enceladus for a second. I'm going to show you what those plumes actually look like first. So we're going to zoom into Enceladus right now. And uh, we're going to take a look at this site. So there, there are those plumes that basically the Cassini mission flew through. So it went um, about 14 kilometers away from, uh, from them. And so it was able to detect some of the uh, molecular um, hydrogen and some of the salt that was coming out of here. And uh, today we know that uh, there's actually quite a lot of these on Enceladus and possibly even other so-called ice um, moons or water worlds. Basically, um, moons like uh, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, where um, on the outside you have a very thick layer of ice and on, in, on the inside you very likely will have liquid ocean. And the liquid ocean on Europa is basically even bigger than the one on Earth. Same with Ganymede. But here um, the ocean is smaller than on Earth, but it nevertheless very likely has something hot on the inside that produces these uh, geysers, these eruptions. And despite the temperature on the outside being something like minus 200 degrees Celsius, because this is actually one of the most reflective objects in our solar system, uh, it doesn't really get much heat from the sun. Uh, the inside of this moon is very likely much, much hotter, much, much warmer. And uh, we think that this is because of things like tidal effects um, from nearby moons like, for example, Dione. So if I were to zoom out here, uh, you would see that uh, every time Enceladus orbits close to Dione, which is right there, it uh, receives quite a lot of tidal friction and that sort of hits up the inside of this moon. And I think it's actually a little bit easier to see if I go to Space Engine, zoom out and show you the orbits of all of the moons and basically show you Dione, which is right here, and also Enceladus, which is right here. And if we accelerate time here, you'll see that they actually once in a while um, kind of pass relatively close to each other and because of that Enceladus gets quite a lot of friction and, and tidal effects which often causes 
the inside of this moon to get heated up and thus produce all of these geysers. And these geysers are also responsible for one more thing. They're responsible for one of the rings of Saturn. Specifically, here's actually a better picture of it, specifically the E-ring. So this is the E-ring and this is Enceladus that's basically right inside of it. And we know that E-ring gets replenished by Enceladus's eruptions and essentially creates this very large, very beautiful ring around Saturn that's not as easily seen, but is still there nevertheless. And well, okay, so why exactly is this exciting in terms of findings? Why are we talking about these um, geysers? Why are we talking about this uh, molecular hydrogen? Well, there's actually two reasons. One of the reasons is because we actually have something very similar happening on our own planet Earth. We don't have these, of course, but we have something similar to these that produces similar materials. Specifically, I'm talking about hydrothermal vents. Uh, so this is what we think is happening on the inside of Enceladus. This is actually a video from uh, Bremen University. And um, what's interesting here is that we, we think that uh, these particular um, heated objects, these uh, hydrothermal vents, are basically everywhere on the inside of Enceladus. And because we've detected um, molecular hydrogen, we, we know for a fact that molecular hydrogen is also used on our own planet Earth in these particular conditions to, um, to create all sorts of life. And molecular life, specifically microbiotic life, needs molecular hydrogen to create energy. And then bigger creatures, like for example, these lobsters will eat those bacteria and uh, bigger creatures will eat those lobsters and so on. So um, these hydrothermal vents on our planet Earth create huge, tremendous communities of incredible life. And all of this is underneath, um, you know, thousands of meters of water in complete darkness. So right now, this is like 1500 meters. Um, all of this in, in areas where you wouldn't expect to find so much life, but it is there. And it's absolutely beautiful. And so if this is possible on Earth and all of the conditions for life are also present right here on Enceladus, so why would we not be able to find it there? So this is actually what we think might be happening. We might be actually able to find all of this incredible life underneath all of this ice shell and potentially discover um, similar conditions with similar crazy um, oases of life underneath all of this ice stuff. Now, interestingly, um, we do have one mission at least that could pot potentially look for um, this life. And this is a mission proposed by the scientists um, of European Space Agency. And I believe the mission is actually just simply called Enceladus Life Exploration. And it's a very simple mission. It's basically a probe that would orbit around Enceladus several times and try to catch as many of these molecules as it can and then analyze them for potential signs of life. So we wouldn't even have to go on the inside to find signs of life. And if we do find signs of life, then, you know, this is a sort of uh, an, an indication that we might need to come here and bring some kind of a digging apparatus and go inside and find that life. Um, so that mission might actually launch sometime after 2020 if it passes um, the initial proposal. And it would uh, very likely take, you know, something like five to six years to finally, um, with confidence, say whether there is life on Enceladus or not. And all of this is because we've actually detected this molecular hydrogen very recently and because we know that on Earth it's required for certain types of life in those hydrothermal vents. And this is actually based on the idea of methigenesis, um, a reaction that sustains microbial life in complete darkness underneath the ocean um, in environments where you wouldn't really expect to find life at all. So there might be methigenesis right here on Enceladus and that means that there might be life. And of course, if we find life here, then maybe, just maybe, since Enceladus is very similar to some of the other planets, we might, oh, not planets, but moons, we might be able to also discover um, something similar on uh, Jupiter's moons. And here we're talking about um, Europa, which also looks very, very similar to Enceladus. Basically an ice world uh, with a very large ocean on the inside and its neighbors, uh, Callisto, which is right there. Um, a very beautiful object as well. And of course, the largest moon in our solar system, uh, Ganymede, which is right here as well. This is uh, an object that's possibly a mixture of ice and rock and stuff. And so this might also have a very large ocean underneath. Now, all of this gives us a lot of promise for finding um, life outside of our planet Earth. 
And so all of these findings will hopefully be um, an indication that there's definitely a possibility for life outside of our planet Earth, even if it's just microbial life. And all of this gives us sort of a, a lot of hope that maybe, just maybe, Earth is not the only place in our solar system where life has too cold. So maybe, just maybe, other moons um, around our solar system will actually also be potentially have life. And before we finish uh, this video, let's actually uh, use Universe Sandbox for a one particular experiment that I wanted to try for a long time and still haven't tried. Let's actually, well, first of all, this is more of a size comparison between Enceladus and er the Earth, but in more um, more visual slash more uh, practical approach. But basically, we're going to launch Enceladus at Earth and um, we'll see how big it is in comparison, but also what's going to happen if Enceladus actually does crash, um, if it does crash on the planet Earth. So look how tiny it is. It is a ridiculously small ball. It is actually a lot smaller than you can even imagine. Um, it's basically smaller than most countries on our planet Earth. And like I said before, it's about the size of the United Kingdom. But if it does crash on planet Earth, uh, yeah, things will not go well for us. Things will definitely not go well for us. And anyway, so maybe, maybe just maybe this is how life did come on Earth a long time ago. Or maybe this is how life from Earth came to other moons and other uh, planets in our solar system. But for all we know, hopefully one day we'll find life in our solar system on other planets and discover if there's other uh, microbial and bacterial life out there. And one more time, this is actually what Enceladus looks like in comparison to uh, our planet Earth. This is how tiny it is. And now it's getting even smaller due to tidal effects from our planet. And anyway. Thank you for watching, and if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, share this video with people that enjoy watching space videos, science videos, or gaming through education. No, education through gaming, or both. You know what? Why not both? Anyway, I'll see you guys tomorrow, come back to learn something else interesting, something educational, and something through video games. Or just watch me play a video game. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.